both. Well, thank all three of you for um, coming. Um, as you know, um, we've been looking at the role of Parliament in treaty making and been taking evidence on this, and quite a few people have submitted uh, evidence. Uh, one of the things that we have been told is that um, treaty making is not um, just about trade deals or it's not just about big treaties. There's a heck of a lot of treaties uh, these days. Uh, we also have the uh, Constitutional and Reform Act, which was passed rather quickly at the end of uh, a parliamentary session. And so I think, first of all, we like your views on the, the workings of that act and, and whether you think uh, all the provisions are appropriate. Who goes yeah. first? Um, yes, I think so. I think the fundamental point about all treaties that come towards us is that any impact on our domestic legislation has to be considered properly through the normal parliamentary processes before any treaty is ratified. So where there is any bearing on our law, that proper process of parliamentary scrutiny uh, takes place. Uh, the word treaty is sometimes applied to sort of association agreements which don't have any such impact and are basically a sort of bilateral love-in, uh, and um, it's good that they happen. So there is a sort of spectrum of significance, if you like, of, uh, of treaties, but anything that has an impact on our law is scrutinised, I think, in a satisfactory way. And does that mean you think the 21-day period is um, satisfactory? Uh, my personal view is yes. Um, but, you know, ultimately, anything to do with parliamentary scrutiny is a matter for Parliament, and we in the Foreign Office respect the supremacy of Parliament. But from our point of view, uh, from what we see, I would say that the answer to that is yes. I mean, the, the evidence that we had from the Foreign Office said that they were ready to engage in discussions to strengthen parliamentary uh, scrutiny. Um, does that stand? Uh, I, I think that would stand in perpetuity. In perpetuity. Very good. Lord Norton. Under um, the provisions of the 2010 Act at the moment, um, the position of the House of Commons relative to treaties is pretty equivalent to the negative resolution procedure in terms of triggering any objection. Um, is there a case for putting it the other way round, in having provision for the treaties to come forward to receive parliamentary approval. Because at the moment you've got the problem that even if there was objection in the Commons, there wouldn't necessarily be time found to debate it and consider it. So should there be a mechanism by which one could actually do that? Yes, I mean, in a way, should we move from what's the equivalent of a negative resolution procedure? Because even if the Commons don't like it, you can't necessarily trigger a debate so that the Commons could register its objection. So should we move to something that's more equivalent to the affirmative resolution procedure, that there is a parliamentary mechanism for triggering uh, yeah. debate? Well, I mean, again, I think this is ultimately a matter for Parliament. I mean, as I think... Um, your Lordships have already suggested parliamentary time is already very much at a, a premium, um, and it's going to be all the more mm. so, certainly in the short term, in the aftermath of our leaving the EU. Um, so I think finding time for the Commons, the Lords, to grant uh, express approval for all treaties negotiated in any one year, I mean, there were, I think, 35 last year, uh, would be very challenging. Um, so I think scrutiny, perhaps through a select committee, would, would, would relieve the pressure, but ultimately, I, again, I, th I think this is a, a, a matter for Parliament. So you wouldn't object if there's, a, as you say, a select committee that was a triggering mechanism for recommending particular treaties should be subject to uh, approval? I really don't think that's for us to say. Um, I think I would be a sort of former leader of the House in, in your chair. I, I, I think for us to try and dictate to Parliament what their procedures uh, should be is, is a little bit impertinent. I think the other side of it is that you wouldn't try to stop it happening. Mm. I think uh, I'm not sure we'd succeed if we were to try. So. <laughs> well, there would be the question, of course, of who would bring it forward, because of course the provisions are in crag. It was a government. <coughs> yeah, I mean, 
treaties are, as I say, there is a variety of sort mm. of treaty, and inevitably some are going to attract uh, more attention, more concern, mm. and are more detailed than others. Um, and so we, we fully accept that the process of scrutiny itself might need to be flexible mm. in order not to give the same amount of time to the tiny ones as you would to one of massive significance. So is the government thinking about reviewing it anyway? Because, I mean, the Foreign Office submission said that Craig was the product of lengthy and relatively recent consultation and dialogue. Um, I was on the joint committee that um, examined the Constitutional Renewal Bill, and I was involved with the bill when it through, went through at Washer. So there was a lot of pressure... Um, and it, the only there was an amendment which happened to be mine that actually provided that the government memorandum there was a statute provision for the government to publish a memorandum explaining a treaty. So I'm wondering if the the government itself is actually reviewing the provisions and has any view on the provisions. Nothing of that sort has really come across my desk. I mean, it, it tends to be a much longer term policy issue, and as you can imagine, at the moment we're involved in many more day to day issues. Uh, so uh, it tends to be very clever people in a, in a room somewhere down the corridor. I, I don't know if Julia, I should have introduced Julia properly at the beginning, my apologies, who's Deputy Director of our International Agreements uh, Department in the Foreign Office. I mean, I don't know if she'd like to explain what our setup is in the Foreign Office for addressing this sort of mm. issue. Um, yes, thank you, Minister. Um, there, aren't, there aren't currently um, proposals underway to review Craig as such, but certainly we are working very closely with the clerks to the EU. Um, committee in looking at how that committee will scrutinise the agreements that are now starting to come through, working very closely with Parliament on what the EM should contain so that Parliament has all the information that it, that it needs. Um, but, uh, but, um, and we're open to certainly to discussing how we can support any further scrutiny that Parliament would, would, want, um, you know, would want to put in place. Okay, thank you. Okay. Baron Scorston. Yes, thank you. Um, quite a lot of the evidence that we've had during the course of this inquiry has caused has called for a much greater um, influence and um, um, import by government by Parliament on the treaty making process. If there was to be more such engagement. Would you see this as helping or hindering the government? I think um, look, any kind of scrutiny, you know, we welcome. I think there's a balance. Um, you know, we all fully appreciate that it's Parliament's role to hold ministers to account, um, and ministers negotiating treaties will, 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 you know, always need to have in their mind an understanding of what issues in those treaties. Um, is relevant to Parliament and is seen to be significant for them. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at something like food standards or workers' rights or something, then um, you know you're, you're looking at uh, issues of very high parliamentary salience. And um, you know, we'd have to be idiots not to appreciate their significance in the context of Parliament. Um, so, you know, as some sort of publicly visible negotiations take place, there will be a higher degree of public engagement. I mean, I was very closely involved when I was a DFID minister in the negotiation of the arms trade treaty. And uh, because the sort of goings on uh, were between countries and negotiations, a lot of the exact detail of the negotiations was released on an almost daily basis. And so it was, if you like, fought out or negotiated almost uh, in public as much as uh, in the forums doing the negotiation. So we're back to the spectrum of the different sorts of treaties which uh, require different sorts of scrutiny. Um, so I, I, I think I wouldn't go so far as to say that the engagement should dictate how we negotiate, that we'd have to reveal our hand at all stages uh, and that we can only be mandated to do certain things. I think that would be wrong. Uh, and some treaties, of course, um, you know, are delicate negotiations where uh, as soon as you throw it open to the public gaze, um, you destroy the strength of your negotiating hand. So uh, there is a degree of flexibility here, but I, I think it becomes self-defining in, in many senses that these big, um, if you like, NGO-energised uh, 
uh, treaties, be it chlorinated chicken or the banning of arms, will excite public engagement very strongly in a way that some other bilateral negotiations about, I don't know, aviation or something might not. So um, I think we have to be flexible, but we also, uh, I think the real answer to your question, have to be sensibly politically aware. Okay. Do either you or Ms. Crouch uh, know anything about the workings of the Joint, uh, Joint Select Committee on Treaties in the Australian Parliament and the way that works? I'm sure Julia Crouch does. <laughs> I was assuming that. <laughs> um, I have to confess I don't know the intimate workings of that committee. I know that the Australian government obviously has set up a, a, a committee to give um, fairly intense scrutiny to, to treaties in Australia, but I think one always has to look at the constitutional arrangements in each country to find... Um, they, they may be useful examples, but whether you can lift and transplant that directly into the UK system, I think, is something that needs to be... Um, carefully considered um, so I'm sure there are useful examples to look at but, but Parliament will want to design something that works within our own um, our own system okay. But if I may I, I gave one example of something which uh, was subject to you know, public um, attention all the way through which was the Arms Trade Treaty but let me give you another one on completely the other end of the spectrum which was the Good Friday Agreement mm -hmm. Now had we been under an obligation through the process of the negotiations, legally, un or under the terms of standing orders of the House or something, uh, to reveal exactly what we were doing at every stage, we'd never have got there. So uh, all I'd say is please understand that some treaties are different from others, and if we are trammelled in that way, you destroy the opportunity one needs to be able to have actually to bank a treaty. Yeah, I think we've had examples of uh, that uh, previously as well. Uh, Lord Judge. Recently, well, last week, the House of Lords decided, <coughs> so far as it was concerned, that the Trade Bill would be conditional on the government setting out proposals for the process of making international agreements in the future. It was question six. Um, I I'm not asking this question in the context <coughs> of Brexit at all. I'm just asking for general observations, would you like to comment on the, the view expressed by the House of Lords in relation to the progress of a bill being conditional in this way? Yes, I mean, I think conditionality of that sort, <coughs> I mean, in my personal experience, um, sort of 26 years, same as Chancellor here, Chancellor Duchy, um, is that this is unusual um, and that normally an amendment of that sort would only be specific to the bill itself. Um, and obviously, in terms of the passage of government legislation, we <laughs> sort of regret it <laughs> when anything is delayed. Yeah, um, but it, it, in no way do we want to you know, uh, attack the, uh, the rights of your house to, to do such a thing. Um, if there is an issue about scrutiny, then I think that is a, broadly a separate issue. So, uh, if, if I'm allowed to express mild but polite regret, I hope you can take it in that vein. Uh, does that mean that um, you have considered it and, as far as you were concerned, you would reject it? No, I mean, I'm the Foreign Office, I'm not the Department of Trade, uh, right. nor am I the Leader of the House of Commons, so I'm not going to say anything more uh, r robust or judgmental than I've, I've offered already. Right, OK. Does the Chancellor want to say anything about this particular No, not, not on this one. It's, uh, I think, for Sir Alan. One of the main themes we've been considering is transparency. And, Minister, you've already said that, plainly, there are circumstances where confidentiality is absolutely essential to the success of negotiations, either as to the detail or, and we heard some examples, uh, the very fact that you're negotiating at all with another country or the Falklands or Spain or, 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 or whoever. The question is whether you would accept, uh, as Sir Malcolm Rifkin did in his evidence to us, uh, that the political principle should be a presumption of openness. And that would be subject to two vital caveats. The first is that it would remain for the government to decide whether there was a good reason for restricting openness. And secondly, that this would not be a legal principle because the last thing that you would want 
is lawyers taking you off to court to argue uh, about the application. But subject to those qualifications, would you accept that we should formally adopt a political principle of a presumption of openness? No. I think this would be an error. Um, I think it would make negotiations very difficult. I think it, uh, as we've seen, I think already in public debate, it reduces uh, the exchange of opinion and the ramping up of opinion to that of pretty simplistic slogans, uh, which are you know, very good for uh, an NGO's sort of profile, but not very good for the quality of public debate. Um, I think that Parliament is the place to scrutinise. I think the, the forum of, of sort of, if you like, um, almost, I would say, social media exchange for negotiating treaties would not be fruitful. Um, so transparency, of course, ultimately is very important, but at the right stage uh, and in the right way and at the appropriate level. Um, I mean, negotiation is an art. I mean, in my commercial life, I've negotiated lots of large commercial transactions and I was sort of thinking what would happen if they'd been subject to public scrutiny while I was doing it. What matters is the public scrutiny of the consequences and the conclusion, not the process. And I think if you're having to be transparent about the process, then I think it puts the very process itself in a very difficult and probably much weaker position. I think in the, in the end, particularly as we're approaching probably a world in which we are going to have to do many more things bilaterally and fewer as an EU block, um, we would find that um, we're actually doing ourselves down. And as we actually bring to ourselves and this parliament and this country its own autonomous sovereign authority to do these things, we want to make sure that we can do them in the right way. And of course, we would only be doing them for our own interests and not part of a block of 28. So the assumption should be that, you know, we are doing things that are good for the country. I'm sure you're right that um, if there were more openness, there would be many simplistic slogans, to use your phrase. But do you not also accept that there's a real public interest in engaging people about these important subjects? And some outsiders, some, may have valuable points to make if there is more transparency, which may assist arriving at a better result, not least because by the time the treaty gets back to Parliament, uh, the work has been done, and it's very difficult at that stage uh, to, to influence. So I, I'm not suggesting complete openness. I, I, I emphasise that. Uh, but I, I can't at the moment understand why you're, you're so concerned uh, about openness where, where there's no specific reason to restrict it. Because presumptions turn into obligations. Uh, which then turn into judicial reviews <coughs> and all sorts of things. And where, where perhaps we do agree with each other is that there needs to be proper high-quality engagement with interested parties, particularly where there are serious legal consequences. Uh, and um, I would like to think that that does exist. And I think that, um, again, I, I, I go back to the arms trade treaty where um, I was the... DFID minister responsible uh, for that treaty at the time, which uh, culminated in a successful uh, endorsement by the UN, agreement by the UN. And the, the level of engagement we had was absolutely massive, both with NGOs, with arms manufacturers, with all interested parties. Now, that did not need some kind of entrenched or embedded presumption of transparency it was quite simply the proper responsible process of government. And we adjusted the level of engagement to match the appropriateness of the treaty that was being negotiated. And um, I think that's probably something we would always do. And so, you know, we've had the, the Canada Treaty with lots of NGOs firing off their views. Uh, we, I'm sure, if we were to be negotiating with the United States on a free trade agreement, there would be massive uh, public interest in what were happening, what were going to be included and discussed. Um, but if there's something like, you know, some kind of nuclear uh, deproliferation or reduction treaty, 
you're into a completely different world where a presumption of transparency were, would be likely to ask us to reveal lots of things that it would not be appropriate to reveal. So what then would that presumption of transparency actually have meant? So this has to be calibrated, I think. And I, I actually would like... I, I genuinely think that we do and that we are a proper, you know, broadly open, democratic society, but where we need to keep confidences for the long-term, deeper interests of the country, we should be able to do so. But where we need to engage parties who have a direct interest because they might be affected by it, then we should do so. Thank you. Well, I just have a question about a sort of asymmetry of disclosure. We might have a view mm. as to how much transparency there should be on our side of the negotiation. <clears throat> but what happens if the other people we're negotiating with, their procedures are more transparent? And obviously the key to any negotiation, part of it, is managing the external uh, environment. And um, could we not potentially be on the back foot if the other side is putting stuff into the public domain that we're not prepared to, to well, um, disclose? No, not necessarily. I think that's all part of the art of negotiation. It might put us on the front foot. Mm -hmm. So... Um, uh, asymmetry can work both ways, uh, but working out where the pros and cons lie is part of the art. And so that would be, um, you know, if you like, a, a state of affairs which would uh, call into play the, the great wisdom of the Foreign Office in working out how best to um, uh, work for British interests. Lord Beath. You described where you're having quite constructive discussion with NGOs and treaty negotiations go along. What does tend to happen is that Parliament is out of the loop. And the NGOs come to the MPs and peers and say, do you know the government is trying to negotiate X or Y? Uh, which does suggest that there's a, there's a missing element in the procedure. And it's interesting that the Prime Minister, in the different context of the transition period for Brexit, did actually talk about confidential committee hearings. We, we may deliver confidential committee hearings to ensure that Parliament has the most up-to-date information while not undermining the negotiations. So if that is acceptable in principle, and we're not talking about the Brexit aspect now, um, it presumably has some potential in treaty negotiations, generally. I don't think there's a missing element in this. I think what you've described is the process of our constitutional structure, which is that we have an executive and a legislature, but the legislature, in its 24-7 you know, scrutiny of the executive, is perfectly entitled within that scrutiny to say, oi, you're doing this treaty, are you going to include X, Y, and Z, or have you thought about A, B, C? And so, if you like, for that loop to connect in that way is perfectly acceptable. It, 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 it's then up to the executive to decide whether they... Um, as it were, show their hand in great detail, or whether they say, well, we're in the midst of negotiations, we're just going to hold back until we're in the right... I think our question is accepted that, and, and certainly Lord Panic was indicating, it, it, it's the executive's decision in the end how, how transparent it can afford to be. What I'm pointing to is the unsatisfactory situation where the NGOs are being told what the government is thinking about doing, and Parliament isn't, and maybe that's because Parliament hasn't got a structure in place that in exactly fits the government's need to maintain a degree of confidentiality. I don't know whether the... Uh, That's interesting. I mean, the, I mean certainly the, I mean, the, the discussions as far as Brexit is concerned are... You know, they're not by any means at a, at a conclusive state. I mean, today you know, is going to be the first opportunity, for example, to understand the views of the Leader of the Opposition on, 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 on this. Um, but um, the, the Prime Minister is very concerned to, to try to find a mechanism for, for, for phase two, if I can describe it that way. Of, and of my question really is whether this yeah, mechanism that applies elsewhere. Use. I mean, I think I wouldn't want to give a pledge of that. Because, I mean, first of all, we've got to see how the, how the discussions with parliamentarians about, about a structure for um, you know, the future partnership with the EU works out. Um, that, you know, if, if it reflects the ambitions set out in the government's white paper is going to be much more wide-ranging than a normal bilateral treaty with an individual country because it would cover economic matters, um, political cooperation, security cooperation, police and criminal justice cooperation, and so on. Um, certainly, as I say, we're at early stages testing the views, select committee chairs, party leaders and spokesmen and so on. 
I mean, the sort of models that you know we've had in the back of our minds include um, the different range of models that there are in EU member states at the moment for considering um, their government's approach to a negotiation. In some some cases, and this obviously the UK is approach generally, there's the distinction between executive and legislature, and the executive reports back, and the legislature expresses its view and perhaps decides whether or not to endorse uh, what the government has done. The Danes, I suppose, is at the other end of the spectrum, where the Danish minister has to pop out of the Council of Ministers meeting to phone um, the equivalent of Sir William Cash to ask for permission to alter the mandate. Um, and um, uh, I I, I don't want to prejudice what may, may be done. I don't think that that's going to be the likely outcome of, of um, current discussions. But you look at what Finland does, what Sweden does, where it's a sort of like, like a softer mandate. But to go to, to um, I think, uh, Lord Eve's point, um, it does raise questions about how Parliament deals with these things. Because under our current system, the expectation normally of a select committee in either house is that its proceedings are held in public, and also that evidence, once given either orally or in writing to a committee, becomes the property of that committee, and it is the committee that ultimately, not the evidence giver, who decides um, whether this should be made public. Um, so um, the, the, I think this is why I say it's not just a matter of government saying, well, this is how we'd like to set it up. I mean, I think that if, if, if parliamentarians are wanting in these EU negotiations and even beyond that to, to say, well, we think we should have more of a, an input and, and, and even, you know, do we grant an outline mandate? Um, then it, that does require a big shift in culture on the part of parliament, of cross-party parliamentary committees as well. So you're agreeing that it shouldn't be transparency; it should be engagement where appropriate and within certain circumstances. I, yeah, I, I think that's right. I, say, I don't. I don't. I'm. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not um, willing to be pinned. I can't be pinned down on, 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 uh, with precision at the moment because these discussions are at an, at an early stage. Yeah, but, I was but, thinking but, out with Brexit, but um, yeah, and I think I think yeah, I think engagement engagement rather than automatic transparency. If you're going to have a negotiation um, with another sovereign government, you have to have flexibility uh, over your own negotiating position, how you present your, your case to that government. Oh, you know, the, the, the last thing in the world that we should be doing is um, uh, say, you know, saying in public, you know, what are the things that we might bid for that we're prepared to sacrifice in order exactly. to get the things that we are prepared to settle for in any negotiation. Lord Hunt. Just developing, perhaps not in the context of Brexit for a moment, but just parliamentary scrutiny of mm. treaties generally. Now, if Parliament establishes a treaty scrutiny committee, mm. um, would the government be willing to grant it some form of scrutiny reserve such right. that it could complete its work scrutinising treaties before treaties were laid before Parliament and before that 21-day <coughs> period started ticking? Chancellor. I think it's Rowland in the first place. I might chip in. Oh, sorry, oh, former it's Chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> possibly former future Chancellor. <laughs> possibly a few. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Look, at, at the moment, um, the way the scrutiny reserve works um, is that UK ministers may not agree to a proposal for the European Council. I know you're looking beyond Europe, but let's start with Europe. Um, to authorise the EU to either sign or provisionally apply or conclude an international agreement um, until the EU scrutiny committees of both houses uh, have finished their scrutiny. Um, the European Scrutiny Committee has the power to recommend a proposal for debate in the European Committee on the floor of the House. Ministers should not vote um, in the European Council on proposals when the committee has not cleared or which are awaiting debate. Um, but that scrutiny reserve can be overridden in certain cases, as yes. you well know, and we, we, we do that for reasons I think uh, we all understand. In, in terms of granting a sort of formal scrutiny reserve, I, I, I think it's something we need to consider carefully. 
Um, I think we've got to um, perhaps be a little careful about just sort of lifting and shifting uh, practices which have been built up in an EU context, because I think things are going to be different. I mean, the EU scrutiny reserve um, you know, stems from the fact that the EU Commission negotiates uh, free trade agreements on behalf of all 28 states, and obviously that is not going to be the case. Um, it, uh, it also ensures that um, international agreements do not bind the UK uh, through e EU law until they have been scrutinized by Parliament, which is very important. So we will not need a scrutiny mechanism to fulfill this same purpose when we're no longer bound by EU law. So I think, I think this needs quite a lot of thinking. Um, I think we're going to have to adapt a lot of things once we've left the EU, and this is clearly one of them that will need to be looked at because uh, we're no longer looking at a collective uh, you know, political body making the law. We're looking at our own sovereign autonomous right to do so. Um, so I think, I think we need to work out how it would work and, and also how it might work in exceptional cases uh, where... Um, you know, the processes are, there will be exceptional cases, but we don't quite know exactly what they'd be yet, but we need to be open-minded, I think, about the fact they will exist. I think, you know, mm -hmm. look, if, if, you, uh, if you come up with your report with this suggestion, it's something the government would, would take away and look at seriously, clearly, but, but, but for reasons Alan gave, I mean, it's, it's not straightforward. I mean, the the, the ability to override is important. I, I, think I probably hold something of a record for the number of overrides I've made of um, uh, both Lords and Commons scrutiny committees, usually because of very fast-moving um, negotiations about sanctions, the way you just needed to take action swiftly to avoid the flight of yeah. assets or of individuals. Um, so one needs to have that, that, that power to override, um, and that would need to be agreed, I think, in, in uh, giving effect to the proposition that Lord Hunt puts, puts forward. Um, and then could one have a model of override that could apply to any, each and every potential treaty? I mean, the other thing that strikes me is that in a post-EU future, we are probably looking at um, a significant increase in the number of yes. treaties that the United Kingdom would seek to negotiate and implement. And those would be quite disparate in character. And so would a single treaty scrutiny committee actually have within it the capacity and expertise to deal with things that might be as different as I just asked the question, as different as a you know a fisheries treaty with Iceland, an FTA with Mexico, a political cooperation agreement with uh, let's say um, Kyrgyzstan. Um, uh, a military assistance treaty with Kuwait, you know, <coughs> that, 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 that it would surely be necessary for each of those hypothetical examples, for whichever committee or committees were looking at it, to take account of the views of experts on the particular areas of policy that were the subject matter of that treaty. Now, mm. how long, therefore, would this parliamentary process take... Um, would it actually do it, if I'm thinking perhaps in Commons rather than Lord's terms, but you know, I think the departmental select committees at our end of the palace might say, well, it should be the subject-specific committees that have the lead rather than a new, new committee. But so, I, mean, these, I, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of detail that would have to be explored and questions teased out, I think, before we, we would you know, say, OK, well, let's go ahead with this. the variations in the way that you could have a central committee and other committees mm. involved. Mm. So, um, you know, we have thought about that to mm. a certain extent. Uh, Lord Dunlop. Turn to devolved issues. Yeah. I mean, la last week, uh, I think the Prime Minister committed to an enhanced role for devolved administrations in the next phase of the EU negotiations. I mean, thinking about that question uh, more, more generally, I mean, how do you foresee involving the devolved administrations uh, in negotiating uh, treaties uh, that engage devolved competence. Yes, I mean, clearly there's, there's sort of two um, immediate strands to this. There's the, um, what's happening in 
what I described phase two of EU talks and then um, the question of third country FTAs and potentially other uh, treaties into the, into the future. Now, obviously, the, the existing memorandum of understanding that governs devolution recognises that it's a duty of the UK government to involve the devolved governments as fully as possible in discussions about the formulation of the UK government position on EU and international issues wherever those touch on uh, devolved competencies. Um, now, that is done in the European context at the moment, primarily through the JMC set up, um, through meetings of so phase one. We've had meetings of the JMCE uh, European Negotiations Committee and the newer uh, Ministerial Forum on European Negotiations that involved devolved uh, uh, governments and uh, at the moment the Northern Ireland Civil Service in the absence of an executive. Um, Last week, the PM hosted a trilateral uh, with the two first ministers, uh, and I think one, one needs to actually be, be able to be sufficiently flexible to have short notice bilateral, trilateral meetings in addition to formal JMCEN or JMCP structures. Phase two, and one of the things the PM put to, to the two first ministers last week was that what is, would be your views on? Uh, how to give an enhanced role for the devolved in terms of the, the second phase of the EU negotiations. And certainly what um, I know is it, in, in her mind, the government's mind, is, is the model, for example, that we've tried to follow on things like fisheries negotiations and the annual meeting on fixing of quotas, where we've had um, really intensive discussions between DEFRA as the Whitehall departmental lead uh, and the fisheries ministers and their official teams from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And I, I can remember going over to Brussels for ministerial business of my own, uh, overlapping with the big annual fisheries meeting in December, and you know about 30 people crowded into the UK delegation room in the Justice Lipsius building, um, because all the devolves were there in force. And at times, you know, it depends how many seats are actually available in the ministerial room. At times, um, devolved ministers or devolved officials have been um, if not at the, formally at the table with the UK nameplate, they have been um, in the room, so they've been able to go and to talk to the minister in the chair or to pass notes and to actually really see what is, what is going on there. I mean, for FTAs, looking beyond Europe at the moment, um, uh, I talked to trade ministers yesterday, knowing that this, 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 the subject was likely to come up, and DIT is having detailed discussions with the devolved administrations at official level about their role in future trade agreements. And the aim is to agree a framework for that before exit date from the EU. So those talks are going well. Um, they, the outcomes we expect of the offer certainly includes a regular minister, interministerial forum on international trade. Um, but I hope very much that um, subject to the, the, view, the final views of the Secretary of State for international trade and obviously of the devolved governments themselves that um, will all be in a position to go into a lot more detail on this in the near future. So uh, you're open to the idea both on the next phase of EU negotiations and free trade agreements that the devolves could actually be part of the negotiating team? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yes, um, I think exactly how they fit into the negotiating team um, is... is, is a question to be determined. Ultimately, all three of the devolution acts make it clear that the uh, negotiation uh, of uh, international agreements is a reserved matter for the government of the United Kingdom and for the Parliament of the United Kingdom as far as ratification is concerned. So structures have to reflect that fact that ultimately this is a reserved matter. But it is all, what is also true is that those international agreements will touch on things, the implementation of which uh, may be a devolved competence. I mean, fisheries being a classic example, but environment, environment may be mm. another. Uh, and so it is right that the UK lead negotiator should not only be um, fully cognizant of the specific interests and concerns of the devolved governments, um, I have to take the obvious example of 
the fact that to reflect an international agreement in Scots law is going to require something different from mm -hmm. reflecting it in English law. Um, but also that that UK lead minister, I think it's right, they should, should be giving the devolved ministers an opportunity to, to, to seek to influence the UK negotiating. You see, that's not the same thing as saying that you know, there has to be a, a veto or you know, having some sort of qualified majority voting yeah. system to establish the, the, this. I don't think that's right. And members of the House of Commons from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have the right to hold UK ministers accountable for what happens in, in any such international agreement. So um, it's, it's finding a practical method that works but genuinely does try to, to, to ensure that the devolved administrations feel that they are being seriously listened listen to and, and that people living in those uh, uh, areas of the UK feel that their interests are being properly taken into account. Now, now obviously one would hope that you know, peace and harmony would reign on these uh, issues <laughs> uh, but given, given experience perhaps not so I just wonder whether you have any thoughts of you know, how disagreements can be resolved and what sort of mechanisms and yeah. processes might be put in place to actually sort of take the heat out of some of these issues. Well um, I mean, we're looking at um, dispute resolution mechanisms as part of the intergovernmental uh, review that's going on at the moment. Um, and the, there is, as Lord Dunlop knows, um, you know, reference in the memorandum of understanding on devolution already to dispute re resolution. One of the things that we, we're, we're doing through the IGR is discussing how we might... Um, cover to adapt the memorandum to cover all dispute re resolutions uh, that were needed as uh, either to touched on intergovernmental relations but then that needs to dovetail with the governance agreements being worked up for particular issues like like common uk frameworks um post uh, post uh, eu single market um so um work in progress on that i think at the end of the day the where I am on this is that the default position is that you 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 have to go back to the uh, what the devolution act say about where competence and the right to decide ultimately lies, but you buttress that legal underpinning with conventions, memorandums of understanding, and habits of good practice. So. I would cite, it was controversial, but I think the, you know, the agreement that we were able to reach with the Welsh Government during the passage of the uh, EU Withdrawal Bill on how we managed the potential application of Section 12 freezing powers was important because we, we basically agreed that the, well, the ultimate power lay with the UK Parliament, that the UK Government would abide by a clear code in terms of formally taking account of the views of the devolved governments and parliaments, reporting those back, reporting quarterly on whether these powers were still needed and so on. And we, we, we came to a, an agreement with the Welsh Government that I think has so far worked pretty well. And can you just sort of comment generally on how the IGR review and the work on common frameworks is going? It's going and, and what yeah. sort of time scale uh, you're working to on all it's going, it's going constructively. I mean, you know, like a lot else in, 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 in government, um, the, the sheer administrative as well as legislative workload involved with Brexit, uh, meaning that it's probably going more slowly than one, one might otherwise have wished. But timescale, um, uh, the, we had a JMC plenary uh, in, on the 19th of December where the Prime Minister and the First Ministers reviewed progress um, since the IGR was launched the March uh, 2018 JMCP. Um, and we've continued work, the officials have, uh, have been told to continue work um, uh, on really five key headings. One was dispute resolution that I've alluded to. Um, then there's a set of principles that should provide a context for future relations, governance of common frameworks, future intergovernmental machinery, and uh, how to uh, it, it have structures to ensure we have effective cooperation and joint working on the international matters in the future. So um, no firm date's been set for the next JMCP meeting, um, so I can't, I can't give a clear <laughs> deadline for that. Um, but, um, you know, we, and, and those discussions are mostly being conducted at official level at, okay. the, at the moment, but um, they're going constructively.
And final quick point for me, um, do you see any role for devolved legislators in uh, approving treaties that engage devolved competence? In actually approving treaties that... Uh, uh, I think that um, the... I don't really see the... Um, I don't see how you can apply Sewell to treaties. The, uh, the devolution acts um, are clear that international relations are responsibility of UK government and parliament. And the Sewell Convention applies to legislation but not to the negotiation of treaties. Now obviously where a treaty requires implementing legislation which touches on a devolved competence, then Sewell kicks in. So in those circumstances we would need to seek a legislative consent motion in the usual way. Um, uh, and then, you know, ultimately it's ultimately then a matter for the UK Parliament to decide uh, what should, should happen. Um, and um, so I think that mechanism is probably the best one to rely on. I wouldn't, I'm not at the moment certainly tempted to try to invent some, some new uh, system for treaties. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, one of the problems, I think, is that uh, uh, devolution and uh, the competences of the devolved assemblies have become more important over, uh, over time. The Seal Convention has acquired more significance simply because the devolved assemblies are doing more and have a claim uh, to do more. Uh, I wonder whether the way in which this, this has been approached has been uh, altogether uh, helpful. We've jumped straight in to key areas of competence for the assemblies, agriculture and fisheries. They've become more important as the European connection has, has dissolved. I mean, doesn't it give the impression that a lot of the... Uh, disagreement about the role of the devolved assemblies has really uh, not, not been necessary. It's injected an area of uh, conflict which uh, shouldn't have been there. Well, of course, the, the, the need to do that stemmed from the 2016 referendum result. Um, and I think what is true is that at the, at the time that the Blair government brought in the devolution settlements in 1998-9. I mean, the assumption in all parts of the UK and pretty much across the House of Parliament would have, would have been that um, membership of the European Union was going to continue indefinitely and that therefore you, know, you didn't need to think about um, those matters that, that were subject to the EU acquis. Um, now, what the, the decision to leave the European Union has therefore forced on all political institutions, is a sudden need to focus on those issues which pre where previously a U the UK-wide regulatory framework was set at European level. And, and then to try to work out what, what that means in terms of how both how the, the different devolution acts apply, and they apply, of course, in slightly different ways, um, uh, to the delinea delineation of the competences that are returning from the uh, EU level, <clears throat> and how you set that alongside um, a UK government competence over international agreements, and uh, key things like the provision of a UK-wide single market, uh, which businesses in all parts of the UK tell us is absolutely essential for their continued prosperity. So working those things out in short order has been a challenge. And there have been, you know, in fact, there have been some differences and disagreements. Um, I, you know, I'm not here to make party political points, but, but you know, the, the difference has been sharpest with the, the Scottish government. In part, that reflects a political difference between a unionist government in London and a uh, a, a nationalist government in Holyrood um, the, with the different strategic constitutional objectives. Um, but I think I could point to a good track record where sustained engagement with the devolved administrations uh, has yielded 
fruit. There have been the, uh, uh, measures, for example, where the, we have changed um, language and, and uh, clauses in the Agriculture Bill uh, in order to meet specific concerns expressed by the devolved governments. Um, if you look at the, um, uh, the, the European withdrawal, uh, European um, uh, withdrawal implementation, uh, I mean, you know, the, 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 the work's been gone on that. We'd have been talking to devolved governments at official level about that. Um, if you look at some of the no deal planning now, um, uh, the, the, the first ministers or their um, ministerial spokesmen have been invited now to, by the Prime Minister to attend the uh, meetings of the, um, the, the uh, Cabinet Committee <coughs> that's dealing with sort of EU exit preparations for both deal and no deal <coughs> scenarios. So they are being, being uh, I think, brought in uh, to an increasing degree. And I think you know, we're not going to avoid bumps, but I do, there's a genuine wish on our part to minimise those and to respond. And the feedback that I get from the devolved ministers is, is by no means just negative. I mean, you know, there are complaints, there are disagreements from time to time, but there's also credit being given that, that um, where departments have engaged seriously with them. Would it not help if the joint ministerial council were not a more effective and uh, broadly credible body? It's been very unsatisfactory in personnel and in when it meets... Uh, since under both Labour, well, under Labour and Coalition and Conservative governments, uh, we've laboured its inadequacies in previous discussions in this committee. But isn't that a, a serious problem? No, I, I think I, do, I, I, I don't. I don't accept that in the way that Lord Morgan's posed the question. I mean, I think I'm perfectly happy to accept that. You know, this is work that needs to continue to progress as for um, reasons Lord Morgan says the powers of devolved administrations, the habit of devolution has developed over the years and the, the machinery needs to respond to, to that but I think that the some, to some extent the tensions arise from the fact that you have different political parties running the governments in different parts of the United Kingdom now if one goes back to when this was all set up, and Northern Ireland's too generous, obviously, but um, United Kingdom, Wales and Scotland were all being run initially by, by Labour governments, um, and, and to, to some extent, I, 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 others around the table will know the ins, ins and outs this better than me, but, but you know, to some extent this, you know, this has been dealt with in the family. Um, now, when, you know, if you're, you're in a position where you have a you know, a Conservative government in one place and a Nationalist government somewhere else and a Labour government in a third jurisdiction, it's all, you know, a little bit more jagged. In, in the, the, the intimacy of political relationships is, is, not, the, is not the same. Um, but I look at the track record. I mean, to date, we've had 15 meetings of the Joint Ministerial Committee on European negotiations and six of the, the newer ministerial Forums. I have up the frequency of the uh, JMCEN meetings, and we've initiated the, the forum meetings. Uh, and uh, we try to we try to meet. We haven't always succeeded, and I've had to apologise. I had to postpone a meeting uh, of la last week for other reasons um, on um, of, of the JMCEN, which I'm trying to reschedule as rapidly as possible. But um, we've been seeking to meet monthly, um, and I have tried to stress to my Scottish and Welsh counterparts, that it should not be a matter of waiting for a ministerial meeting or forum. If there's a problem, they should phone me, they should phone the relevant Secretary of State. It's the habit of informal working together to resolve difficulties that I think, as, as much as anything formal, that is the answer to the, the, the problems and, and tensions to which Lord Morgan refers. Yes. Thank you. Can I go back to um, what was being said earlier about uh, Brexit and the consequences of Brexit on, on treaty making? I think mention was made of an increase in volume of treaties and indeed uh, a change in the nature of some of the treaties that we will be facing. And I'd like your assessment on that. But also, given what has happened in Parliament, you know, 
is Parliament ever going to look at treaty making in exactly the same way and sit back as it has in the past, given the extent almost to Parliament to want to negotiate treaties or Brexit treaty, which obviously it can't do, but don't you think we've sort of gone over a step, well, seen a step change, really, in terms of Parliament wanting to be involved in a way that possibly can't be turned back, even if that was desirable? Yeah. I mean, look, in the short term, I think there will be quite a, a rush. Um, one of the consequences of leaving the EU is that we will have to replicate bilaterally a lot of the treaties, particularly in the area of trade, which have been um, assigned uh, as part of the EU bloc. So, you know, if it's straightforward replication, um, then the process, I hope, would be seen as more straightforward. Um, but that would mean that the volume in the in the short term would um, uh, increase. Um, so that you know, there will be trade agreements. Um, we're always, of course, still going to have sort of multilateral agreements, such as the Hague, Hague Convention, things dealing on child support, that kind of thing. In the Foreign Office, uh, we lead on 16 association trade agreements, um, and there will also be a number of uh, political agreements uh, which will need to be replicated, and which we do. What, what the long-term impact uh, on the total volume of treaty making will be, uh, I think, remains to be seen. Um, but uh, and it may mean that we're able, because we're doing things bilaterally, uh, you know, on a sovereign basis, we may be able to do things more quickly uh, than uh, doing it as part of a block, because we're representing just our own interests, not those of 28 countries, which include our own. Um, and we may be able to take a slightly different approach. I mean, in some cases, we, we don't have a treaty as such. We 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 just get on with it. Um, and so I think there will be perhaps a greater degree of flexibility uh, over, over how we structure these things. So early to say, but certainly at the beginning there's going to be a bit of a rush, of course. Yeah. And do you think it is inevitable that Parliament will look for more involvement? Not necessarily. I mean, I think if um, it may just be Parliament says... No, please make sure you can replicate what you had and get on with it. And, uh, and if they see that it's the same, they may be unexcited by it. On the other hand, if there is a completely new uh, trade agreement or uh, association agreement of some sort, for the sort of reasons we were discussing earlier in this witness session, uh, they may get more excited. And I think we have to be flexible, again, to appreciate where there is polit political sensitivity and um, engagement from interested parties to make sure that we are alert and responsive to all of those things. Lord Beast, do you want to? That follow that. Really, the, we're going to enter into a period where Parliament will do what it hasn't really been doing over the last few months. Uh, it's, it's, it's arguing about the extent to which replication should take place. Uh, you used the word uh, replication a moment ago. Uh, there will be political arguments about whether we should continue in many areas of policy to do what was done in Europe or whether it should continue. Um, the, 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 the formal transfer has been one of replication, but we then enter a period in which even in discussing what the agreement should be, people will be arguing about should we carry on with this environmental provision or should we change it? Uh, should we carry on with this aspect of judicial cooperation or does it need to be altered in some way? And uh, the, the, it appears from the Prime Minister's statement that, at any rate, that she's, she does envisage that select committees will be quite involved in this process um, over, over the, the coming months. I wonder if uh, Mr. Liddington has any comment on that. I mean, select committee, I mean, we always want to see select committees um, take an active interest in this. I and mean, one of my frustrations when I was... Um, you know, doing Sir Alan's job at the Foreign Office was, was, was that I found it so difficult to interest the Commons Departmental Select Committees in the European aspects of their business. They tended to mm. think that this was all a matter for the European Scrutiny Committee and uh, they shouldn't get involved. Mm. Actually, the, their terms of reference explicitly uh, address their, their European responsibilities. Um, I mean, no, there were some that better than others. I mean, the Treasury Select Committee, for example, I mean, because financial services are such an important sector – 
in the UK economy, uh, did take a keen interest in EU financial services regulations. Um, and, and the DEFRA Select Committee similarly, but I mean, it's not true of every departmental select committee. So, I mean, the government's part there is, um, you know, uh, um, the perfect uh, sort of acceptance and, and you know, willingness to see select committees take a more active interest in all this. And the, the, the Prime Minister actually referred to the negotiating mandate as being for the discussions which are about to be to mm. begin. That, that takes, takes us back to um, the point I made uh, in response to an earlier question uh, about uh, the practice and culture of select committees, because it t does take us to, to, to the question mm -hmm. of um, <laughs> the relationship between government and legislature and whether that if, if we were to move to a world where we had a, a mandate system. There are arguments for and against doing that. I think the two things that seem to me that would be essential for any mandate system to work, I'm not, not committing the government to such a, an approach, but you know, were that to be explored, then you'd need to have some very, very clear and trustworthy uh, culture of confidentiality. Mm. Um, so I don't see how you could operate otherwise if you're in a, a, a negotiation with another country or group of countries. Uh, and you would also need to have a mandate system that allowed um, degrees of freedom to the negotiator. Well, I fully accept the, the confidentiality required for some things, yeah. but some of these issues are going to be right out into the open. It would be an open public argument about whether the government's mandate is to seek to maintain and replicate advantageous things that we <laughs> some people believe that we've got in Europe, or whether the view of the other people that we should take advantage of a new freedom to do things differently should be exercised, and that the government should therefore uh, take a negotiating mandate which reflects one or other of these principles. I, I think well, uh, government, at the end of the day, government, you know, government is elected you know, to, to, to take decisions and to be accountable to Parliament. For those decisions, and I and I and I, I think that um, you know if there is a majority in Parliament to block something that the government wants to do, then there are plenty of occasions, in, uh, whether it's come to legislation or to ratification, mm -hmm. where Parliament can can do that um, if it really objects to something that the government has done. Um, but I think that um, you know I. I I mean, not be the who do think of the, the the real dilemma here, but I, I don't think you could have a system where parliamentary committees try to micromanage um, uh, a government's approach to a negotiation. But also, a mandate can be uh, permissive, yeah. or instructive, or both. Mm -hmm. And it might say, take the um, trade agreement we've got with um, Ruritania now and add to it what you can. Or it might say take the trade agreement that exists and on no account include chlorinated chicken. I mean, a mandate can take many <laughs> forms and I, I don't think I've yet heard of any sort of principles or methodology mm. uh, which have been suggested which would explain exactly what the yeah. criteria might be mm. in a mandate and how they might be helpful to British interests. But maybe any system that is devised would evolve over time rather than try to fix every eventuality or potential uh, episode right at the beginning. Uh, that's very often the case. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Uh, Ms. Crouch, uh, Ministers, is there anything you would like to add that we haven't covered that you would like to tell the committee before you leave? No, I think, I think everything has been covered. That Officials tend to say the Ministers have done that. <laughs> 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 I was just giving the opportunity yeah. just in case. <laughs> it's worth a try. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.